Dr. Eastman, thank you. Thank you very kindly. And to all of you, thank you for having me today. I sometimes think the commencement speaker is a little bit like the body at an Irish wake. <laughs> Essential for the ceremony, but you don't really want it to do too much. <laughs> but it's such an honor to be here today, such an honor to share with you the class of 2015, this wonderful day. You know, across our country, there are some 3,000 colleges and universities. They all have value. Some are stronger than others. But I hope you realize, by being here at ECAD, what you've accomplished. For instance, most colleges have some sort of service learning projects. But here at ECAD, every single one of you does them. And that's exceptional. As seniors, you're all in a capstone project. The combination of these two things make your experience at Eckert almost unique. Many colleges have good faculties. But here you've got a great faculty that not only teaches, but works with you to help you in so many other ways. And I'll be very surprised if many of you haven't made good friends among this faculty who will remain your friends for years and years to come. You come from 48 states and 40 different countries. If you follow previous classes, next year 77% of you will be employed full time or pursuing former ed further education. So it's very, very clear that you can be so proud of that agree, degree that you're about to earn. So let me take just one moment just to celebrate and applaud the ECAD class of 2015. Congratulations <laughs> to you. But I'm also here to remind you of something. You have an obligation that you're going to get today along with your degree. And you've got to use that degree not just to earn a living, but also to serve perhaps a larger purpose. We need you to help restore the fabric of our country. Now, you've, you have the advantage of, having, of learning at an institution where diversity is an everyday fact of life. You've sat in classrooms, labs, and studios with people from any number of tapestry of backgrounds. Together, you've asked questions about truth and beauty, science and literature, economics and medicine. You've seen what can happen when people of goodwill transcend their differences and get to know and understand each other. I've seen it, and I know some of you worked with the Multicultural Center here. I'm sure you've discovered that for all your differences, there is much more every day that unites you than that which divides you. We need to bring that recognition back into our public life. Our country is becoming more and more diverse every single day, and that's a good thing. But in some ways, it's also more and more divisive as well. We have to work at understanding each other. Otherwise, it's going to be me on CNN and you on Fox, and never the twain shall meet. Several years ago, the great historian Arthur Schlesinger wrote a book called The Disuniting of America. His point was that unlike many countries around the world, the United States were not connected really by any common ethnic heritage. Instead, we're held together by ideas, equality, individual liberty, the rule of law, human rights, opportunity, declaration of independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Now, if we abandon our understanding of those ideas, it's going to be very hard to keep this country together. Well, it's hard to build on those ideas if we're not talking to one another. And the problem is especially bad in Washington. And I gather here in Florida, Tallahassee isn't any better. People really don't know each other anymore. Two members of Congress from opposite parties can serve together for 10 years down in Washington and hardly ever say hello to one another. 
Now, it used to be different. My father was a congressman. And on Sunday afternoons, his committee chairman used to come over to talk to him. And they'd try to decide what would be the best way to proceed for the coming week. They were from different political parties, but that didn't matter. They had a common goal, and that goal was really to serve the people of this country. And they weren't the exception. On weekends and Saturday nights, there were parties around Washington. And members of Congress would go to parties with each other and their spouses. I attended schools with the children of other congressmen. We knew each other as families, and we became friends. And when you build that kind of relationship, when you become friends, it's very hard to be deeply partisan because you know the person on the other side of the aisle is there for the very right reason, trying him or herself to do the best possible job. Well, it's so different now. And these days, members of Congress fly in on Tuesday and leave on Thursday. And the only parties they attend are political fundraisers, fundraisers for their own side, their own party. They never meet the guy or the gal across the aisle. So they don't have the time or the inclination to consider the other person's point of view, the arguments. Instead, it's a zero-sum game. Somebody has to win, and somebody has to lose. So we get gridlock, we get incivility. And that's no way to run a republic. And in the end, when Washington works that way, it's you and I who are going to suffer. Now, how do we change that? Sometimes you simply have to force the issue. I remember when I was appointed chair of the 9-11 Commission, I was the outsider. The whole rest of the group was, had been, their whole careers had been in Washington. When I walked into the room, typical Washington, all the Democrats were sitting over here in the corner, all the Republicans were sitting talking to each other in the other corner. And I had an idea. So to start off the meeting, I said, we're going to lay down a couple of ground rules right away. Never again in a meeting are you going to sit next to somebody from your own party. And so, that's how we work as a commission, whether it was a meeting or whether it was a public hearing and television, whatever it was, Republicans sat next to Democrats, Democrats sat next to Republicans, and we put a bipartisan face on the whole thing. Now, because I was a new guy in town, I just got there, all the television shows wanted me, and they all called. And I remember telling, uh, well, I called Tim Russett, he then used to run Meet the Press, I said, I'm not going to go on your show unless you put my vice chairman, Lee Hamilton, on with me, because we're going to run this as a bipartisan commission. He said to me, guests don't pick other guests, so you can't do that. I said, OK, we'll get somebody else then. Two hours later, we call back. <laughs> We'd love to have both of you. So Lee and I appeared that Sunday, and every other time we got asked, but then, through the year and a half life of the commission, neither of us ever went on television without the other. So he always presented a bipartisan face. And we told the other members of the commission, if you get asked to appear on radio or television, why don't you bring somebody from the other side of the aisle with you? So you follow our example, and the two of you. So we, we not only presented that face to the public, but in the process, we got to know each other very, very well. And when it came time to issue a report, we stopped arguing about parties and ide ideologies and really got together on making a unanimous bipartisan report. Now, people tell me that that 9-11 report is still the only anonymous bipartisan work on any important subject in Washington in the last 10 years. We need to get to know each other. It's the only way we'll discover there's more that we have in common. It's the only way we'll learn that compromise isn't a dirty word. Remember, our nation was formed by a compromise. Large states and small states, if that compromise hadn't been done, we wouldn't be sitting here in the United States of America. Most of the programs I'm proudest of during my governorship happened because of compromise between the two parties, and we all took credit together. We need to see so much more of that. 
in Washington, and in society. And we need more civility, too. As a boy, George Washington took to, kept to carrying around a, 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 a list that he had copied of more than 100 rules of civility. Now, most of them are sort of outdated, but the common core was to think of the other person before you act. Some rules apply today as much as ever. For example, let your conversation be without malice or envy. When another speaks, be attentive to yourself and labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire that we call conscience. Now, civility isn't agreement. It isn't capitulation either. It's respect for the people who hold opposing views and a willingness to accept that they have good reasons for holding those views. And the more you are open to talking to one another, the less you try to win the argument and just have the discussion, the more likely you are to find that there's some common ground and see that your opponent isn't really your enemy. You both want the same big picture things, freedom, opportunity, the chance to make a better life for yourself and for your family. New Jersey's great African-American leader, Paul Robeson, used to sing a song, and it was called The House I Live In. It asked the question, what is America to me? The song went on to speak about the words of old Abe Lincoln, of Jefferson and Payne, of Washington and Douglas, and the task that still remains, about all races and religions, about the right to speak your mind out. Robeson's wonderful song concluded with these simple words. The house I live in, the goodness everywhere, a land of wealth and beauty with enough for all to share, a house that we call freedom, the home of liberty, but especially the people. That's America to me. Graduates, by coming to Eckerd, you have made just a wonderful start in your life. You've learned from exceptional professors and gifted students from all sorts of backgrounds and beliefs. Always remember what your Eckhart education has meant to you. Remember that others made sacrifices so that you can graduate today. So I urge you, honor your Eckhart degree, turn it into a career of integrity and achievement, use it to improve the world around you, get to know people, get to understand them, Build those relationships in your workplace, your neighborhood, your house of worship, your Facebook group. You have the power to make your generation the very best, and we need you so much. Help preserve those precious ideas that help define this country. Help us to break the gridlock. Help us to hold our society together. Once again, congratulations to the class of 2015. Thank you.